Hello again, everybody, or for the first time, if you're just tuning in today. Um, my name is Sam Morielli. I use they, them pronouns, and I am one of the producers for the Prelude 2020 Festival, Sites of Revolution. I'm super excited um, to get this live stream going um, for our fourth panel, um, which is called um, Get Rid of the Gala. Um, this panel, <clears throat> excuse me, I lost track of where I was going. Um, this panel uh, is hosted, first and foremost, um, we are hosted by the Martin E. Siegel Center. Um, this panel is going to explore the fact that most nonprofits host an annual fundraising gala, an event that seems to amplify every aspect of the, fee of the field's inequity. Uh, attendance is overwhelmingly white and rich, and artists often perform for little or no money. Um, this gathering seeks to reimagine the gala and how it can reflect the shared values of everyone who makes the work on stage possible. I am super excited about the folks that we have lined up to speak about this issue um, and imagine some revelatory practices uh, for how our nonprofit industry does make money. Um, before we jump into the panel itself, I want to pay homage um, to the ancestral lands on which I am sitting. Um, I am on the lands of Lenape, um, who have stewarded this space um, for centuries um, and deserve to have their land back. Um, and I encourage you uh, to continue supporting the land back movement, um, knowing how you can get involved with um, the indigenous peoples on which on whose land you are um, residing, uh, as I will do the same. Um, so without further ado, welcome again to the fourth panel, Get Rid of the Gala, and I'm going to turn it over to our lovely panelists. Hey, y'all. <laughs> and I think this is it. Hello. I think it's us in a room. OK, great. And then great. I think that is uh, our cue to get started um, with a few brief intros, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, go, go for it, Cynthia. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> hi, I am Cynthia Flowers. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I am joining you from the unceded land of the Lenape and the Canarsi peoples. And um, I'm gonna explain just a little bit about my background and then start with my opener or um, would you all like to introduce yourselves first? That sounds perfect, you take it. Okay, great. No so along with Sarah Benson and Maropi Pepinidis, I am one of three directors of the theater company Soho Rep. I joined Soho Rep in 2012, initially in the role of the executive director. Um, and I have stayed at the company for the last eight years because I love the values of the company, the aesthetics of the work that we produce, um, and the relationships that I have with my colleagues, the artists that we work with, um, and yes, even my board, believe it or not. Um, in terms of my background, I am a white, cis, heterosexual woman who was raised in a small, extremely conservative town in East Texas. Early on, I had some sense that theater could be my ticket out. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to attend USC and Los Angeles, where I quickly learned I was a terrible actor. After college, I moved to New York City to direct and to start my own theater company, but I was pretty quickly overwhelmed by the financial instability of it all, and I started for looking for theater admin jobs in order to have a consistent paycheck. I was hired as the development assistant at Playwrights Horizons in 2006, where I thought I could convince them to transfer me out of the fundraising department and into the literary department within like six months. That is not how it works. And um, in 2010, I solidified my commitment to a career in professional fundraising when I accepted the role of director of development at the Atlantic Theater Company. So between all of that, I have planned or overseen 15 galas that have probably netted about $7 million for three theaters in New York City. 
Um, and hundreds of my administrative and artistic colleagues have devoted thousands and thousands of hours of collective effort towards those um, fundraising events. So when Miranda and David asked me to participate in this panel, they asked me to consider the question, what could theater and performance institutions do instead of their annual gala? I was really excited to think about this question in part because I have developed a lot of feelings about galas over the last 15 years that I've been producing them, um, but also because their question overlaps with other questions that I've been obsessing over since every theater in New York City shut down in March of this year. And the first question, I guess, that I was thinking about a lot was, why doesn't anyone care about us? And by us, I mean the 750 or so off and off Broadway theaters, off off Broadway theaters that provide half a billion dollars of wages annually to thousands of war arts workers across the city. Nearly one third of TCG theater members reported that they would be forced to consider closure as early as 2021 without serious government intervention and creative worker unemployment as it is at an astonishing nearly 65%. It feels like the entire field as we know it might be on the precipice of extinction. And yet major foundations have told me that they are pausing grant making while they wait to see, quote, who sinks and who swims. Elected city officials have told off-Broadway leaders that we produce, quote, super spreading events and any meaningful federal relief for arts institutions or workers has indefinitely stalled. It would be easy to pin the blame for this entire sad state of affairs entirely on other people, other institutions, other systems. But more and more, a new and discomforting set of questions keeps me up at night. I wonder, how are we reaping what we have sown? Why are we so fragile to begin with? What is this moment revealing about existing illnesses within our institutions and how did they take hold? Why doesn't the great mass of citizens, citizenry seem to care about whether we exist at all or not? So to return to this evening's prompt, what could theater and performance institutions do instead of their annual gala? I think my answer is that instead of spending hundreds of hours planning yet another gala, we should use that time to push our institutions out of the increasingly individualistic and scarcity-based framework that we have inherited and into a radically reimagined and collective way of building abundant resources. I know that was a lot, so I will say it again. Instead of spending hundreds of hours planning yet another gala, we should use that time to push our institutions out of the increasingly individualistic and scarcity-based framework that we have inherited and into a radically reimagined and collective way of building abundant resources. So I'll explain. First of all, we live in a deeply capitalist country and it is very difficult, if not impossible, for a single performing arts institution to exist over time in a traditional market economy. I will not <laughs> break all of this down, but the reasons for this were clearly articulated in a classic 1966 text called Performing Arts, The Economic Dilemma. And basically the author said, that in a traditional manufacturing business, you have technology and other forms of innovation, which lead to increased productivity, which enables businesses to theoretically decrease prices and raise wages while still building up a surplus, which can be used to reinvest in the company. That is not possible in the performance arts because um, the performer's labor is the end product that the consumer is purchasing. So while there is technology we have developed to reduce the labor necessary to produce a toaster, no one has yet devised a way of reducing the amount of labor required to make a play, a dance piece, or a concert without compromising artistic quality. So it's argued that it's nearly impossible for arts organizations to be self-sustaining and to break even 
without some kind of subsidy. If you have ever been responsible for making sure that you have the cash on hand to make payroll, you will understand how acute the need to subsidize your arts organization can be. And consciously or unconsciously, for decades, arts institutions have generally relied on three forms of subsidy to reach a balanced budget. Reduced and capped labor costs, high ticket prices, and an outsized reliance on fundraising. The problem or problems or a problem is that even if we avoid questions of whether or not these subsidies are right or wrong, or if they lead to art that's interesting or beautiful or important, or even if we are only considering the economics of these three so-called solutions, they actually make the economic challenges of producing theater worse over time, which is again, why I think that instead of spending hundreds of hours planning yet another gala, we should push our institutions out of increasingly individualistic and scarcity-based frameworks, which we've inherited and into a radically reimagined and collective way of building abundant resources. I don't think there's anyone who's worked in the nonprofit theater for any length of time who doesn't understand the inherent problem of each of these three subsidies. And I literally might write a book on this and I think I only have two minutes left. <laughs> So I am briefly just going to touch on two of those subsidies, labor subsidy and fundraising subsidy, labor subsidy because I'm currently obsessed with it, and fundraising subsidy because that's what I'm ostensibly here to talk about. Labor cost subsidies are typically carried directly by theater workers through the underpayment of creative theater artists and through the overworking of theater arts administrators. This undervaluing of labor and the distinct differences in which artistic and administrative labor is undervalued contributes greatly to the toxic work environment of many producing theaters. And I think it is one of the most prevalent and least understood sources of tension and othering among artists and administrative staffs. Because a theater artist knowingly or unknowingly has only agreed to be underpaid because they are explicitly or implicitly promised the psychic income of creativity, pleasure, personal satisfaction, and burnt out arts administrators work 50, 60, 70 hours a week in traditionally hierarchical organizations on increasingly mundane and nicheified tasks while making just enough to never escape the career they've chosen in arts administration. Economically, even economically, this practice places obvious limitations on how an institution can survive. It limits the talent that chooses to enter our particular workforce. It limits how long they stay in our industry before they are crushed by its financial realities. And it decreases worker engagement, which impacts the quality of the work, the creativity at our institutions, innovation within the field. Okay, that's labor subsidies. As we all know, institutions are also increasingly reliant on fundraising subsidies, foundation grants, corporate sponsorship, individual giving, and of course, the annual gala. The racism and classism embedded in our current philanthropic system is at this point well-documented and understood from broad statistics like the fact that 55% of arts funding is going to 2% of arts organizations with annual budgets over $5 million to specific stories like the fact that the Community Foundation of Atlanta directed exactly 0% of its first round of COVID-related arts emergency funding to Black-led organizations. Galas in particular, with their tiered sponsorship level, socialite appear, appeal, hundreds of hours of uncompensated intern, staff, and artist labor are short-sighted, highly competitive, reinforce money as a default measure of worth and distracts us from our larger missions. Um, 
<laughs> we are doomed if we keep going like this. COVID or no, the proof is in the pudding. Many of our arts institutions were already on the brink of collapse before this shutdown began. So what we are doing is clearly not working and doing the same thing <laughs> over and over again, despite the fact that it's not working is the very definition of insanity. So what are we to do instead? Well, I would like to admit that the details of how we are to change are not yet quite clear to me. This is the beginning of a thought exercise and an invitation to sit with a new understanding of a shared condition for which there is no immediate single solution. But I do believe that there is a collective way to build abundant resources within our reach if we refocus the efforts of the institution and we collectively organize. For example, I wonder if we could say, abandon, dissolve, and reform new theatrical unions as unions and other performing arts industries have historically secured much more significant gains in wages and working conditions for their members. Or perhaps we could secure universal health care. If we had universal health care, an institution like Soho Rep could redirect as much as 10% of its entire budget into other labor costs or affordable tickets. It also might force those theatrical unions to make larger gains for its members in wages and working conditions in order to justify their existence. Reduce student loan debt and generate affordable housing to minimize the labor pressures on both institutions and individuals. Increase access to arts education to enable more citizens to think of themselves as theater makers, as audience members, as in fact, citizen advocates for the arts. Um, again, this is just the beginning of some ideas I have and the response to this question of what should we do instead of the gala. Um, I am looking forward to talking with the rest of the panel um, about all of this. And I also just want to acknowledge um, some other people who have really shaped my thinking, who in this moment, who everybody should check out. One is the actor Chris Myers, who's hosting a series of free learning study groups called Anti-Capitalism for Artists. Um, Diane Ragsdale's blog Jumper is awesome and really diving into um, why an institution should exist or not in this time. Um, in 2014, a group of artists made a report called the Brooklyn Commune called The View From Here, which I still read like twice a month. Um, and then of course, um, you know, my colleagues at the theater, Sarah and Ropi, who I'm in conversation with like every day. And that's it, that's my kickoff. Oh my God, that was can incredible. We, can we just take a moment? I mean, like, I think that the three of us have to uplift each other. That was phenomenal. Wow. Thank you. Really, really inspiring. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Ooh. Just some things I'm thinking Ooh. about. I mean, but also like you didn't see us over here snapping. Yeah. I, don't, I, I don't know if the audience can see the chat, but like we're chatting amongst ourselves just being like, yeah, what is that? Yeah. Sure. So. <laughs> Let's reinvent it, everyone. Let's reinvent yeah. it. Sanjay, you're up. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Sanjay Kim. Um, today I welcome um, any pronouns, she, he, or they, um, or something else. Um, I am in Seoul, South Korea, um, which is where I'm from, and it is the ancestral traditional land of my people, um, the Korean people. Um, Seoul was uh, the ancient capital of many kingdoms, um, and most recently the Joseon dynasty. Um, and it's one of the few places in the world, I feel like, where um, there is theater still. Um, so I've been seeing shows and, you know, sort of like watching how, um, how it's possible, why and how and why it's possible here. And the answer has like, it's, it is about the government response. Like it is about the fact that like COVID is like way more under control, but it's also, it's, it's actually, I think more about the economics um, it's in and it's more about like unions and labor structures and sort of um, and, and also about like who the audience is and like what they're willing to um, how they're willing to like shift their behavior or not. Um, so that's been really interesting and you know I'm happy to talk more about that like later. Um, 
but yeah I mean I I had like a tiny thing but I'm sort of gonna just like speak from the heart because I feel like I'm so like I was so moved by your remarks Cynthia and like thank you again um so I, I think I was approached to do this by lovely Miranda and David um, because I'm, I'm writing a piece for HowlRound um, called Abolish the Fellowship Industrial Complex, um, which is like a like, cheeky like title. And I think the same, like in, in which I sort of am gonna talk about like the term like industrial complex and like what that means and like the relationship of like, um, you know, like the, the creation of this thing is, is actually like the thing, like rather than it like serving like a purpose. Um, and I think sort of like the same thing could be said to galas, right? Like it's, I feel like, um, so my, the thing I'm writing about is like, like our, our fellowships, like genuine, um, pushes and opportunities for to like support emerging artists young artists especially like BIPOC artists or like are they sort of like a performance in on its own to sort of like signal a kind of um like signal some kind of like value system um more so than like it actually being a sustainable like practice and I think the uh, I think we can say like similar things about like the practice of the gala um I don't know if I hate galas actually personally um I'm like a fancy girl so I like to dress up and I like to like um you know like kind of like be seen out on the town um I I enjoy that um and I've actually been on both sides um I'm a Scorpio Sam <laughs> obviously <laughs> um, <laughs> but um uh Taurus Moon Pisces Rising Scorpio Mars um I keep going but I know like people probably watching are probably like very confused about my detour just there. But I, um, so I, I've been on like both sides of this actually. Like I've been the artist paraded around. Um, I've been the artist sort of like put on stage and kind of like be like, look at this inspiring young Asian woman. And and then I've also been um, the, uh, I've been, I, I directed the Ars Nova, um, kind of anti-gala actually, like Nova Ball um, last year and um and another gala for a group called the lobbyist um so i've kind of like been on both sides and i think what i like enjoy about them um i think what i really loved about like doing nova ball was like you know it was like i got to see all my friends um everyone was like in the same room and it was um you know, we were honoring like Joe Iconis and like all his collaborators sort of like came and like surprised him with this like big number. And it really felt like communal. It really felt um, powerful. It really felt like we were just like um, having fun. And I think when I was sort of like pondering this and then the parts that I don't, so that's the part that I enjoy is like seeing my friends um and 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 being together and especially now like now that that's not a thing like I really I, I miss that feeling um and then the parts that I don't like about it are it's probably obvious but that sort of like performance of opulence and like the 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 caste system the literal sort of like tiered caste system that it um performs of like okay like if you pay this much you get to sit at like this table and like with this famous person and like, and the literal and the very like huge gap between um, like the people who were financially dependent on um, and like, and, and us and like what, and that like really like intense dissonance between like, I don't think any of us is like, I am like making art for, I am making theater for like this old white like man person um, you know, like no one like like no one is like consciously thinking that, but that in it's sort of like in the financial reality of it, like that's like our patron. And I don't know how, what to do with that. And like artists have always had patrons, like Michael Ange, like all these like like historical artistic male geniuses I like, had like huge patrons, and that's how you know we've always um done our thing. And it's nothing new, but like I don't really I just don't know what to do with that sort of like intellectual um dissonance so that's a part of it about it that I struggle with and when I was like imagining you know what else we could we do um I mean I don't know like I feel like um 
like one thing I was it's like so silly it seems so silly but like what if we had like birthday parties you know what if we had like like a birthday party for Soho Rep or like birthday party for like Ars Nova and like it it, it, it and and just the like because I don't think that there's in the like like Cynthia said like we live in a capitalistic system like there's sort of like no inherent like um shame and like we need money like that's just like a thing um but it's just that like how do we like um yeah like how do we imagine a structure where like if it actually could feel more like mutual aid than um this like caste um system of like um making the like a few wealth like wealthy people feel like really good and like really really special like what if it could feel like um what if we could feel like an occasion where like we all love Soho Rep, like we all love Soho Rep, we all care about Soho Rep, like we're all happy to be here for Soho Rep and we're all happy to like, um, like kind of like the Bernie Sanders like $27 model, like we're all happy to like chip in a little bit so like our friend Soho Rep can um, keep doing its thing and like yeah it's mutual aid it's a birth it's a birthday party or like it's sort of like um, yeah it's sort of like a it, like what if these events could feel like something where the community is like making a collective decision to come together and like celebrate and, and invest, um, sort of collectively invest in like the future of the organization, um, rather than it being like a, a performance of like opulence for just like the selected few. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. That, that's, uh, I think that's it. And I, I'm really excited to like have this conversation actually. I feel like super awake and jazzed up. Okay, Brian, all you. Well, I love that. I, I love that you're um, inspired and calling in from Seoul. So we're half a world apart. So good morning. Good morning. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, nighttime out here, as you can see. Um, my name is Brian Joseph Lee. I use he, him pronouns. I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Lenape people. Uh, in Washington Heights here in Manhattan. And uh, what about me? I'm a Southern born queer black man who has dedicated my life to amplifying stories of my community and my people. And so whether that's black folks, queer folks, trans folks, BIPOC folks and people of color, um, I've done that work for quite some time. I've done that work in a variety of disciplines, working in classical music, the museum field, art galleries, fine arts, uh, theater festivals, um, and theater companies. And I've often done that work in context of predominantly white institutions. And so I find myself sort of in this, you know, very uh, particular tension that most BIPOCs working within uh, white institution feel uh, sort of the integrity that we hold of ourselves and our own communities and how that is in relationship to an inherently racist uh, supremacist structure. And that's both within the individual institutions and the fields uh, at large. But throughout that, you know, my, my personal mission uh, is inspired by my family. It's inspired by, you know, my family are troublemakers and freedom fighters and Row, uh, rum runners, you know, they break rules, they have fun, they gather together, and it's that spirit that I bring, uh, hopefully, into whatever space that I occupy. So, whether it was built uh, with me in mind or not. Um, I'm now uh, the director of public forum at the public theater, and so most of my work sits at the intersection of arts and civic engagement. So how we show up both as uh, individuals, but as artists, activists, and organizers in our community, hoping to make change. Um, and so that actually is a good sort of foregrounding to how I'm entering into this conversation, which is you know two things that I kind of want to acknowledge here. One is that on many things, I am not a fundraiser. Um, and I appreciate fundraisers. I think you all do incredible work. Um, some of the best, most brilliant dramaturgical minds I have met in the fundraising departments of places that I've worked. Um, but I have always had a difficult time plugging into um, fundraising and philanthropy. And I think a lot of that has to do with my background and my identity, that particularly as a young queer Black man, um, it's felt uh, impossible for me to uh, ask for money traditionally from older, wealthier 
cis white folks. Um, that's been a psychological barrier um, that borders prostitution and it's something that's really difficult for me to wrap my head around. And I think, you know, obviously we all have our ways of negotiating that. I go to work every day. I am part of a field that is, you know, at best 50-50 split between earned and contributed revenue. And I recognize that the nonprofit arts uh, uh, landscape depends on this kind of philanthropy. But I think the closer I get to that flame, the more it burns. And so I've never really had a positive relationship when it comes to fundraising. Uh, and I don't think I'm alone. I think that most uh, Black and BIPOC artists, particularly who enter into the nonprofit world, are negotiating um, a broken relationship. And whether that relationship is between the artist and the institution, um, the fact that, you know, particularly artists and, and communities of color can be um, uh, uh, highlighted, uplifted. You, you, you'll see a lot of diverse faces come gala season uh, on fundraising uh, literature spoken about in your grant proposals and very little of that money actually goes to the communities uh, on whose you know uh, identity and reputation these institutions make their living. And let's not get it twisted, right? That these institutions are legitimized, particularly by communities of color. Uh, we make them real. They don't actually have um, a, a market position or value even within this broken system without us. And so I do think that that relationship is inherently exploitative, extractive, um, and, and flawed. And I think that we feel that most intimately in these moments, like Sanjay was pointing to, you know, when uh, these galas sort of encapsulate uh, all of those flawed structures in one. And, you know, uh, on a personal level, I have had, I've been to many galas across many institutions, and there have been many, many moments where I've been, you know, exploited, otherized, made to feel less than, uh, you know, and whether that's as a staff member who's told to defer to older, wealthier white folks, or whether, you know, it's me or someone that I know being called boy by an elder white person, whether it's me or someone I know being mistaken for another person of color, whether it's me or someone I know who is told that you can attend and sit at a table, but you can't eat. Uh, it, it, it's all of that that's really embedded in the sort of like visceral experience of what it means to participate in these events. So I'm bringing that layer into this that, you know, I haven't had the best sort of access point when it comes to this conversation. Um, the second opinion I have, however, is that like any context, any conversation about how we relate to galas and fundraising has to be in sort of put in context of this present moment. Um, we are seven months into a pandemic that is fundamentally stop the arts world in our tracks. No one has made a significant amount of earned revenue in seven months. And so for an industry that at best, you know, most of our arts institutions, particularly the brick and mortars are 50, 60, 70, 80% of their annual income is supported by earned revenue and ticket sales. And that obviously depends on which institutions you're in, but like I'm using that as a broad scope. Uh, for the fiscal year that just ended FY20, this pandemic was um, uh, earth shattering. It, it upended a lot of plans. It made our financial picture really difficult. It caused a lot of people to um, go on furlough or lose their jobs. It caused institutions to uh, tighten their belts. Um, and you know those institutions, especially over the summer, leaned on philanthropy and virtual galas as a way to support that immediate stopgap. Um, I think the challenge is that what was um, what felt like an insurmountable hurdle for FY20 is all but you know destructive for FY21. There is no scenario in which a majority of our arts organizations and theater companies can sustain an entire year of producing programming and staffing without earned it revenue. Just as uh, fundamentally impossible in the business model that we have. Um, that makes things like galas really important, but a gala alone will not, you know, fill the the, the major deficit, the major stopgap between like what it takes to run these institutions and, and what we actually have. And I think that Cynthia, you know, you illustrated that point so beautifully that the system was already broken before this pandemic uh, with how much sort of like, you know, uh, uh, deficits we're carrying in, in our labor structures and in our relationship to artists. and it's just going to be that much harder in the year to come and in the years to come. And so to acknowledge that any opinion that I have about galas 
I think requires us to admit that, you know, philanthropy is incredibly important. The sustaining and building of those relationships, especially during a pandemic, are important not only for what they bring us now, but because those people will be the people that our, our institutions rely on to see us through this moment, right? And so I don't want to uh, enter into this conversation without giving my full, full appreciation and, and, and reverence to those folks who have navigated, particularly our fundraising community, who has supported uh, arts and arts institutions through this time. Um, they are really like, there, there is no other way for us to carry through this moment. Um, and that brings me to sort of my opinion on where we go and how we move forward, right? That we are talking about moving chairs on the deck of the Titanic. I think that the ship is going down <laughs> and without some major shifts in uh, both our fundraising and, and funding structures and our business models, I don't see a way that uh, this particular conversation about gala, uh, you know, can really correct a path uh, that we're on. I, I am driven to um, one particular resource, uh, Edgar Villanueva, who wrote a book called Decolonizing Wealth, um, which is a really uh, powerful uh, uh, book that points to indigenous structures that we can, um, you know, understand as a way to write our relationship to a to a, 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 a philanthropy and that relationship being first of all not only inherently based off of the exploitation of land and the labor and exploitation of slavery which is how many of our largest funders got their generational wealth to begin with but also how that has sort of impacted the u.s tax code which makes philanthropy as a tax deductible um, exploit even possible Right. I think that so much of the systems and structures upon which uh, these art institutions um, have to navigate are inherently flawed. And so my, you know, thinking about what I would change, thinking about how to dream, I point to those things. I point to, you know, my international friends who uh, really want to understand how we fundraise. And I'm like, I want to understand how y'all have federal support and like state support for the arts. It's brilliant. The first thing I would do is tax the rich. Our, our understanding of philanthropy as sort of, you know, giving the most wealthy um, the ability to choose how and where uh, pennies to the dollar go, and that we're sort of like structurally dependent on this fundamental flaw would be righted if we only taxed uh, the wealth of individuals and corporations who would not exist but for the exploitation of people. Um, and it's incredibly important, you know, so call that what you want to call that. I think that the Elizabeth Warren plan was the plan we should have had. Do you know what I mean? That 2% on every dollar above X, Y, or Z can, can, can pay for so much. Uh, I think that there needs to be an expanded federal and state level support and nonprofit subsidies for the arts. I think that uh, subsidy has to happen on the federal level, and we've seen the sort of like difficult spot that we're in right now with the complete and utter um, uh, incompetence at the federal level when it comes to how and when we support our artists and our arts institutions. I think that that would give us the opportunity, you know, and again, like pointing to Cynthia, so much of the, the sort of inequity that's baked into this field would be righted if only we plug those inequities at a larger level. So imagine what student debt relief and, uh, you know, health care for all and housing subsidies and a guaranteed you know universal basic income would do for a field in terms of allowing us to not only attract the best and the brightest but to redirect so much of our institutional support directly to the art and the artists that we're working with um, it would encourage us to support grassroots fundraising um, above major gifts which i think is an incredibly important thing right now so much of the gala world is 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 you know a major gift fundraising model where we're actually not positioning ourselves to the thousands and thousands of audience members we have a year, but we're really targeting those 20, 30, 40 game changers who can write that one check. I think that system has to be upended if we're ever meant to change. And finally, I think we should decolonize our uh, foundations or get rid of them altogether. I think that there's so much about um, how and where money goes it depends on who is at that side of the table when 80 to 90 percent of your funding institutions are completely white, when they create um, criteria that excludes 90 percent of institutions of color, 
um, when no one on your grant panel rep represents the greater communities that you're hoping to serve. These are fundamental and structural inequities that um, have a direct impact on the bottom line and where that dollar goes. And so I do think that when we're talking about how to reimagine a gala, a gala is but you know one sort of expression of a larger uh, system and, and series of systems that have to be corrected and upended. And gratefully, I think what we're seeing is that so much of that instability, so much of that structural inequity is exposed and laid bare and fundamentally breaking right now, which is painful and, and incredible and necessary. And so now is the time to have a conversation like this where we can imagine what comes next. Yes. Yes. Oh, I don't know if we preach into a choir, but let's talk about it. <laughs> I know, I'm like, yeah. and so it was like, yeah, we can't see the, we can only see each other. So we're preaching mm. to each other. <laughs> um, but I wanna thank you for like bringing up decolonizing wealth because I think that is such an important um, like piece of text. And it also reminded me of, you know, there is, um, a uh, organization called Community Centric Fundraising, and they also have a podcast called The Ethical Rainmaker, which is really making the case for um, kind of doing what you're talking about, which is rethinking the kind of focus on like 20 people as the most important people in the room who then mm -hmm. change the work, who then you know, again, I could go into like focusing on 20 people is also not even over the long term economically beneficial, even if, uh, you know, regardless of the ethics of doing that or the way that it impacts the work aesthetically. But, um, you know, one of the things that's so brilliant about what they're talking about doing in terms of what they call a community centric fundraising lens is that they argue that even the way that we've set up kind of major gifts fundraising is like worse for the individual donor than it has to be. That mm -hmm. it infantilizes the individual donor because they enter into relationships with us that are not real relationships where we're having authentic conversations with them where they understand what is actually going on in the industry, in the field, mm -hmm. because we feel like they can't somehow handle the truth or they have an expectation of us that we need to meet. And, you know, I think about, you know, there's a conversation going on now which is also like related to galas where um, reasonably people are asking that for every kind of fundraising event where an artist is brought out to say how great the institution is or to perform at that gala, that they need to be additionally compensated for their time or like, you know, have the right to uh, refuse to be a part of that, which I do think in practice makes sense, but philosophically, I also wonder if that's like an even greater um, like commitment to this idea that donors and artists are separate, that we're somehow not all in the same community together. Like we actually all care about the same, like we do care about theater arts and it, you know, that there is some other way to approach this relationship with um, sorry, I've gone off on a tangent now, but, you know, uh, major gift fundraising that um, is better for everyone involved, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I feel, I feel like there's, there's an assumption in there that I want to believe that we are all on the same side and that we right. do actually believe in the same value system and mission and then there's a part of me that believes that, you know, many people who opt into a system that is broken mm. do so because the system actually benefits them or works well for them. You know, right. like, I don't think that what I, what I view as broken, it might actually be the way that the system is intended to work, right? In which Correct. case, like, there are some people who are positioned with a sense of benevolence and are courted in order to give their funding and other people who have to ask for it. And so I do think that there is, you know, a contract there, explicit or not, that um, we all are required to buy into in order to participate in that exchange. 
And I fundamentally question whether or not that's the contract that we want, or should we get a new one? You know what I oh, mean? Oh, I think we need a new contract and mm -hmm. people will opt in or opt out, you know, mm -hmm. for all the reasons you're describing, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, like, as you both, I, I feel like it, like, I mean, I, everything's sort of like so much like bigger picture than just like the gala or even just theater, but it has to do with like our, our culture's attitude around wealth itself. And like um, mm -hmm. I, this year, I finally understood what like neoliberal, uh, or I guess I was like able to kind of get, I get what like neoliberal means now. That was one of the terms, like one of those terms, like I just like, I'm like, I, I don't know like what <laughs> you mean when you say that. But then like, now I like kind of get it. And I wish David was here. Cause I feel like he would like define it really well. Cause I'm like, um, and then I, like beautiful, like definition, but like, I, I, I like the closest I got to like understanding was like, it's sort of like um the, like putting the onus of like, um like creating positive change in like society on like the individual rather than mm -hmm. like the system and the collective and I was like okay I finally get that and like I think it like yeah like, I think that um the non-profit sector um and and the economic reality of that in general like we've sort of we sort of live in a culture where like yeah like I, I totally agree with you Cynthia it's like that contract isn't like good for in the individual either um you know because it shouldn't like the fundamental like like life of an institution shouldn't depend on like a few people you know mm -hmm. like it shouldn't it, it shouldn't like depend on that contract and yet um like the larger system we live in sort of like creates that and it's not like like I, I also feel like um there's like, there's like a little bit of a side note but like yeah like there's theater in Korea and it's because in, it's because we have a lot of um, federal subsidy um we don't really have like a big theatrical nonprofit sector it's sort of like federal and then like commercial and then like totally indie um and it's a little bit like I now I feel like Korea is like a little bit like fetishized you're like oh look at these like magical people who are like still doing theater but it's like you know there's different problems here like um like in the like in the commercial sector there's a huge gender pay gap for example because most people who go see theater are um young women and like the idea is that they want to go see like hot like cis men um and so like the these these mm -hmm. sort of like male actors get paid like a, a lot like they, they literally get paid like 10 times like their female um colleagues wow. super, yeah it's really fucked and it's a, it's a it's a it's not the same it's a very different sort of capitalistic problem but it's it's again like a uh it's a different it, it like different contracts and diff depending on any one depending on any group of people creates this like um, flawed mm. system, you know, so. And like as somebody who runs an institution, I think what you're talking about in terms of like what we're, um, what we're conditioned to think about in terms of focus on individualism is actually also, it, it happens at the institutional level. We spend all of our time trying to desperately like save our own institution and also um, like in these weird competitive relationships with other institutions within the ecology because we somehow believe that within the institution, the institution alone can like save itself and is responsible alone for whether it succeeds or fails. But there are so many factors outside of each individual institution that contribute to whether that institution is a success or not that have nothing to do with the work you produce, how great a staff you have, right. uh, you know, how good you are at you know, marketing or fundraising or any of those things. And so it's like, I'm just right now, I'm like, we got to get out of that individual mindset, you know? Well, I think the thing that I want to point to when we talk about contracts, right, uh, is Sanjay, the idea you brought up of mutual aid, which to me, mutual aid and community care are contracts that have existed, particularly in communities of color for quite some time. And like that technology is actually indigenous technology. That technology actually exists in the way that either, you know, artists of color, um, uh, uh, arts institutions of color, community driven, you know, uh, uh, networks have, have existed for quite some time, right? It's the way that like 
uh, black folks united together to do the Chitlin circuit. It's the way that our nonprofit, you know, theaters right now, particularly theaters of color, uh, self-organize and work with their local communities in order to like, you know, reflect the best of who they have and to get resources at the ground level because they can't be, you know, necessarily, um, they're not allowed access to resources from large institutions. And so I, I, I do think and believe that there is an educative need for us to break down these silos. Mm -hmm. um, Particularly because, well, so the silos like between institution and institution, like I think that New York theater should and can be, and, and in some cases are working together and we should democratize that so that we understand that like a rising tide lifts all boats rather than crabs in a barrel, one, one person shall rule, right? But more broadly, I think the silos between what we imagine white American theater to be and what we imagine um, BIPOC theaters and theaters in communities of color, there's so much to be gained and learn from that emergent sort of process and the way of building relationship as a business um, that could thrive at a larger level. And I think the reason we haven't seen it thrive is because A, there's one way to be a nonprofit and B, you know, 90% of our um, institutions of color are limited by budget size. They don't even qualify for the larger capital investment in order to move them to the next level. So I do think that there's something there, like as we're having this conversation about what should we do? Like everything within me says, like there are people who probably are doing this right now. They're just not on a radar, particularly like this for us to like, you know, actually amplify them. Agree yeah. a thousand percent. Absolutely. Like, I feel like we need like political, like more political education for um, mm. and like you know I love Cynthia you brought up like um, an actor who's doing like anti-capitalism specifically for artists and you know like maybe we need more avenues where like theater people specifically get together and like learn about the history of mutual aid learn about the like history of community care and in indigenous communities learn about like how people in other countries are doing it um mm -hmm. Learn about what neo like break down what neoliberal means, you know, um, and like sort of like you know now we have this time and and yet like we have the thing that we were always complaining that we never have right like we have mm -hmm. like time and so um it and it's like it's hard because I feel like in times of crisis is the hardest to like zoom out and sort of like look at everything from like, like really examine everything but it's it's so important and like it's work that needs to be done and like I wonder how we can create sort of like avenues of political education and you know what you're saying about like why haven't we like done this work together and you know had this education and you know organized communally in part part of the reason for that is because like generally speaking creative people work six days a week um, because mm. they have garbage, we have garbage unions, which is a whole other panel I'd love to participate in. Um, but so garbage it's like unions. the working conditions are you work six days a week and you're in an environment where even like the co-workers you have, you have them in sort of like intense periods of collectivity together but mainly you're sort of isolated in competition like when everybody's like oh my god it's so amazing that the nba is like striking i'm like you know what partially probably led to that strike the fact that they were all living together in community with one another and had nothing to do but talk about like what is going on in the mm. you know climate of the country right now and the employment environment of the theater actually keeps artists generally overworked and unable to organize together. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that like, we would be remiss. We're talking a lot about how institutions dock with this broken contract, but um, we'd be remiss not to bring artists into the conversation, right? That there's so much about like this exploitation that ends up on the individual the artist, the administrator who has to shoulder so much of this burden in order to participate in the system. And I wonder like these same questions of mutual aid and organizing, you're totally right, exist on the artistic level, exist like individually and how can we support that so that like more 
organizing at the grassroots can affect change in this way. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Same time tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, y'all, we, I, I feel like our, our people are telling us that we probably have a couple minutes left. Are there any like closing hearts, thoughts, ideas? Tax the rich. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Warren 2024. I shouldn't say that, but I'm just like, we got we to find some way to make sure that we're absolutely like changing systems and structures because we're, we're not, you know, in isolation. So much of what we're talking about in terms of like systemic inequity, if that was solved outside of the theater would have tr such a tremendous effect inside of the theater uh, with our artists in our community. And there's thousands, there's like tens of thousands of us within New York City. So that is a powerful collective organizing force. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we are. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That felt like a great time just to jump in to say that <laughs> and to let out this scream that I have. Y'all. Wow, I like, I wanna like slow clap for you because that like mic drops everywhere, truly. <laughs> I am leaving with so many abundance, abolish fellowships, I'm over them. I feel so <laughs> held as a, as a queer gender, whatever, um, like black, brown, poor person in the world. I feel seen by you all and held in this like, in what is such a crazy, like crazy endeavor, like not just the gala, but the way, as you all are pointing out, the way that it truly, the, the way that the gala forms is only resonant of a much larger problem with the way that our, the nonprofit industrial complex functions. I'm so grateful. You all true, I like your articulation of the whole issue, like re truly just like reaching into a mess and also being willing to leave it messier. I think that's so important as we have these conversations and important to moving us towards some sort of liberation. So that that's it. Brian, Cynthia, Sanjay, thank you. Um, I'm in love with you all. Uh, and I, <laughs> I'm glad to be in an industry where you all have are, are throwing your weight around and making some of these changes and practicing some of these changes. Thank you for evoking emergent strategy many times. I will also point people towards the lovely Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, and yeah, I will, I think that's that on the panel. Um, thank you. Do you have any, any la I love this. Any other heart things you feel good? Leave it messy, I love it. Leave it messy, there you go. Let's see. All right. Well, to our folks at home, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this panel is still going to be available. So if you, for some reason, did not catch it or you need to hear it again, um, go to our website, preludenyc2020.com. It will still be streaming throughout the rest of the festival, maybe beyond, who's to say. The panel that happened before this, Black Imagination, if you all weren't able to catch that, I highly encourage. It was, I'm just buzzing with the amount of brilliance I have gotten the opportunity um, to sit in today. So I really encourage everybody at home, um, go check out that, the website for all of our panels. All, like a lot of our artist content is still there and there's still stuff happening tonight. Come back at 8 p.m. to see Welchmertz. Come back at 10 p.m. to meditate with Mayan T.O. Come back tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. to meditate with, with Mayan and then continue the rest of your Prelude Festival. Um, and that, that's my pitch. I did my producerial job and that's that on that. We'll cue the, the waiting music um, and hope you all have good evenings.